Today's video is brought to you by Alliance, Heroes of the Spire. Alliance is currently exploding to the top of the mobile charts, and here's what you should know about this awesome game. It features nearly 400 unique heroes that you can combine in over 10,000 different ways on the battlefield. The game features two really fun ways to play. The first is like more traditional RPGs where you fight giant bosses. The other way is PvP so you can battle your friends and other real people. I could go on about this game for hours, but you should just check it out yourself. The best part is that if you download Alliance via the link below the video, you'll get 50,000 gold and 50 gems to start off the game. That's a pretty sweet deal, so download Alliance Heroes of the Spire today. And without any further delay, here's today's video. Number 3. Mark Perry In July 2002, the police were called to a hotel room in Melbourne, Australia. A woman was found bloody and unconscious in one of the room's showers. She was taken to the hospital and eventually she told the police what happened. The woman was an exotic dancer from Thailand and she was called Penny in the media to protect her privacy. She had hired a male escort named Shane Chartra Abbott and they met in a hotel room. During their meeting, Chartra Abbott told Penny that he was a 200-year-old vampire that needed to drink blood to survive. Penny told the police that he had sexually assaulted her, beat her, and bit off nearly two inches of her tongue. The police arrested Chartra Abbott and charged him with rape. He went to trial in May 2003. On the morning of the fifth day of his trial, Chartra Abbott was leaving his home with his girlfriend and her father. Suddenly, they were attacked by two men wearing masks. One of them physically assaulted the older man, and the other man shot Chartra Abbott point-blank in the chest and the head. The 29-year-old died as he fell to the ground. The police thought that the shooting may have stemmed from the trial. Chartra Abbott specialized in sadomasochism and he saw both male and female clients. He had supposedly seen hundreds of clients and sometimes he made up to $300 a day. The police thought that one of these clients might be worried about what Chartra Abbott might say in court. The police explored that theory, but it didn't lead anywhere. Then in 2006, there was a strange twist in the case. A career criminal confessed to committing the murder. Due to suppression orders from the court, he was only identified by the alias Jack Price. Jack Price said that he learned about Chartra Abbott from a friend named Warren Shea. Shea was friends with a man named Mark Perry, who was Penny's ex-boyfriend. Shea said that Perry wanted someone to kill Chartra Abbott. Shea told Jack Price that Chartra Abbott had sexually assaulted Penny, bit chunks out of her, and left her for dead. After hearing the details of the attack, Jack Price said that he would kill Chartra Abbott for free as a favor. Jack Price said that a man named Evangeline Augustus tried to drive him to Chartra Abbott's home, but they got the wrong address. Jack Price then said he called a police officer who was a friend of his and got the correct address. They drove over to Chartra Abbott's real address and Jack Price shot him to death. After hearing the confession, the police went to interview Mark Perry, but he avoided them before finally disappearing. In 2008, Jack Price was sentenced to life in prison for shooting Chartra Abbott. In 2009, the police announced that there was an official ongoing manhunt for Mark Perry. They were sure he was still in Australia and he had just taken on a new identity. There was a reward for a million dollars for information leading to his arrest. By August 2012, Perry still hadn't been found, but the police did arrest Shea and Gooses. Eleven months later, Perry was finally found in Perth. He was arrested and extradited to Melbourne. In May 2014, the three men went to trial for murder, or they could have been alternatively found guilty of manslaughter. 
In the media, the case was dubbed the Vampire Gigolo Murder. In July, the jury went into deliberations and it lasted four days. The verdict was that all three men were found not guilty on all charges. They walked out of the courtroom free men. Number 2. Richard Wilson Joan McShane Mills grew up in a strict, conservative Catholic family. One of her brothers grew up to be a priest. Mel's family thought that she maintained her conservatism into adulthood. She lived in San Francisco and she was the co-owner of an apparel import business. It turned out that Mills had a much darker side that her family didn't know about. She had been married but she got divorced and she had kept the divorce secret from some of her siblings. She had been living with a man for several years and they were engaged to be married. Mills also liked to party, snort cocaine, and hook up with random men she met. Whatever illusions her family had about her were completely shattered on April 30th, 1983. She was found dead in a hotel room in Los Angeles. The day before she was killed, Mills flew to Los Angeles for a business trip. After the meeting, she went out to a bar where she met Jeffrey Malloy Parker. They ended up in the hotel room together where they did cocaine, drank, and had sex. At some point, Mills stopped breathing. Parker called 911 and then started to perform CPR on Mills. Unfortunately, Parker used too much force. He broke 12 of her ribs, her heart was punctured, and some of her other organs were lacerated. There was also deep bruising on her face. Parker was arrested at the hotel and the police looked in his car. Inside his car was a briefcase full of bags of cocaine. After a second autopsy was performed at the behest of Mills' family, the medical examiner concluded that Mills may have been knocked out by a punch and then stopped breathing. Parker tried to perform CPR, but he didn't know what he was doing and he was too amped up from the cocaine and the adrenaline and he became overzealous. Parker ended up killing Mills when he gave her CPR. Parker was charged with murder and for possession of drugs. He was released after posting a $100,000 bail. As his preliminary hearing approached, Parker was staying at his mother's home. On the night of August 2nd, 1983, two days before his hearing, Parker was out visiting his sister and he returned home at 11.45 p.m. His mother heard two loud pops that broke the silence of the night. She went outside and feet from her door, she found her 36-year-old son dying. He had been shot twice, once in the chest and once in the head. He was pronounced dead at the hospital. The police investigated the murder and they thought it was a professional hit. One theory is that he was killed because he let the police find the drugs in his car and they were confiscated. They investigated that lead, but nothing came from it and the case went cold. Four years later, the police received an anonymous phone call. The caller said that the person who killed Parker was Richard Wilson, who was Joan McShane Mills' fiance. Mills and Richard had lived together in San Francisco. The police traced the call to the home of Robert Clinton Hale of Los Angeles. He was Richard's brother-in-law. Detectives questioned Hale, and he said that when Parker was shot, Richard was living with him. Before the murder, Richard said that he planned on killing Parker. He also showed Hale the gun he planned to use. On the night of the murder, Richard said that he was going back to San Francisco, but he returned to Hale's home later that night and went directly to the shower. About a month after the murder, Richard told Hale that he was the one who killed Parker. The detectives then asked Joan McShane Mills' family about Richard Wilson. They did not have good stories to share about him. 
Mill's family wanted her to have a traditional Catholic funeral, and Richard didn't want that. Richard was apparently very argumentative with Mill's family. He supposedly even got physical with one of her family members, and he threatened to kill other family members. Many of Mill's family members had no idea that she was living with someone, so this was their first encounter with Richard Wilson. They were deeply disturbed by how he acted. They hired a bodyguard during the funeral, and they were worried that Richard was going to steal Mill's body. The detectives also interviewed Richard's family. His brother Ockel told a similar story to Hale. Before the murder, Ockel said that he was partying with Richard. They were drinking whiskey and doing cocaine. Suddenly, Richard blurted out that he planned on killing Parker. And then after the murder, Richard bragged about killing him. Ockel said that Richard told him that he hid in the bushes and waited for Parker to come home. When Parker got to his mother's porch, he shot him in the chest. Parker begged Richard not to shoot again. Richard walked out to Parker as he laid on the ground and grabbed a handful of hair. He put the gun to Parker's temple and pulled the trigger a second time. The detectives asked Hale and Ockel why they didn't report Richard sooner. They both said that they weren't sure if he was telling the truth or not. A warrant was put out for Richard Wilson and he turned himself in. He went to trial in the fall of 1985. The only evidence the district attorney had against Richard was the testimony of his brother and his brother-in-law. Richard's defense lawyers painted both men as alcoholics who had emotional problems. Richard's lawyers claimed that the two men were simply lying. The jury deliberated for two days and they returned with a verdict of not guilty. As he left the courtroom, Richard yelled out to the jurors and courtroom personnel, It's the last you'll see of me. Outside the courtroom, Richard Wilson told reporters that he was going to return to his home in San Francisco and marry his new fiance. Number 1. Gary Ploche In 1983, Gary Ploche of Baton Rouge, Louisiana, was separated from his wife, June and they were planning on getting a divorce. The marriage produced four children, three boys and a girl. The three boys were enrolled in a martial arts class that was taught by 24 year old Jeff Doucette who was an ex-marine. Gary and June, along with almost everyone else who met Doucette, was impressed with him. Doucette made his living by laying carpet but his real passion was teaching karate to young boys. On February 19, 1984, Doucette went to June's home and asked her if her son Jody could come with him for 15 minutes. He wanted to show Jody some carpet that he had laid in a nearby house. June said Jody could go and didn't think much about it. At this point, Doucette was a family friend and several sources said that June and Doucette were dating. Gary, on the other hand, no longer liked Doucette, and it wasn't because he was dating his estranged wife. Gary had heard rumors that Doucette may be inappropriately touching young boys. He told Doucette to stay away from his family. Fifteen minutes went by, and Jody didn't return home. Minutes turned to hours, and June became nervous. She called her brother, who was a sheriff's deputy, and they began looking for Doucette and Jody. Four days later, Doucette and Jody were still missing, and then June finally got in contact with Gary. Gary called the FBI. The FBI investigated Doucette's recent financial dealings, and they learned that he had written a series of bad checks before he kidnapped Jody. Ten days after they disappeared, June's telephone rang. It was Doucette and Jody. The FBI traced the call to a motel in Anaheim, California, not far from Disneyland. On February 29th, the FBI raided the motel and arrested Doucette. 
Jody was found in the motel room, unharmed, and he was reunited with his family. You said said that he kidnapped Jody to try and pressure June to move out to California to be with him. It also turned out that Doucette had been sexually abusing Jody for over a year and the abuse continued in the motel room. Doucette didn't fight extradition and he was flown back to Baton Rouge on March 16, 1984. After touching down in Baton Rouge, Doucette was led through the airport by an FBI agent and two sheriff's deputies while a news crew filmed him. As they walked by some payphones, a man wearing a hat and sunglasses that was talking on one of the phones turned around, aimed a gun about three feet from Doucette's head, and fired once. Doucette fell to the ground, and the shooter dropped the gun. One of the sheriff's deputies recognized the shooter because they were friends. It was Jody's father, Gary Ploche. Doucette died the next day, and Gary was charged with second-degree murder. The shooting stirred up a lot of debate, not just in Baton Rouge, but across the United States. Many people empathized with Gary and said if they were in the same position, they would have done something similar. A defense fund was set up for Gary and the donations poured in. While many people didn't think a father should be punished for killing the child molester that not only abused his son, but several other boys as well, the district attorney's office had to prosecute the murder. Gary's actions, while understandable, were still illegal. If they didn't charge Gary, it might condone other revenge killings and encourage people to take the law into their own hands. That would be a dangerous precedent to set. The case against Gary was pretty much a slam dunk. He brought the gun with him to the airport, he had motive, he shot Doucette in front of three law enforcement agents while a news crew recorded it and he was arrested seconds after it happened. Before it could go to trial, a plea deal was reached. Gary pleaded no contest to manslaughter and he was sentenced to seven years suspended with five years probation and 300 hours of community service. For shooting a man to death, Gary didn't serve one day in prison. Gary Ploche died in October 2014 at the age of 68. Thank you so much for watching today's video. If you liked it, please subscribe for more videos just like it. Please don't forget to visit criminallylisted.com where you can suggest cases and buy merchandise. Please also check out our Patreon page where you can get access to an exclusive podcast. But that's all for today. Thanks again for watching.